So many people in the Bible that we could speak on. Um, we could talk about Moses' mother in the Old Testament. Her name was Jochebed, and she was the one who was told that she couldn't, you know, they told her that they were going to kill her uh, child if it was a boy. And so she hid this boy until she could no longer, and then she had to offer her child and send her child away. And then there's Sarah, a woman who didn't believe that God would bless her uh, with children because of her old age, and uh, God blessed her, and she had to have faith now to receive. There's one of my favorites. Her name is Hannah. Hannah was a mother, and she didn't have a child. She, her faith is what birthed the child in her. And, uh, but what was also important about her is after God gave her the thing that she wanted, she had so much faith in God that she gave them right back to him all the days of her life. But today I want to talk about uh, someone in the Bible, Mark chapter 7, and we don't know her name. We don't know her name. And, uh, but I believe that she is a demonstration of tenacious faith. And so we're going to read in Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30, and we're going to learn from this Syrophoenician woman. Mark chapter, four, Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30, it reads, From there he, talking about Jesus, he arose and he went into the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered into a house, and he wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman, everybody say a woman. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, she heard about him. And when she heard about him, she came and she fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take from the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and she said to him, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table, they eat from the children's crumbs. Then he, talking about Jesus, he said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Father, we pray that you would bless us today. I pray that you would open up our hearts to receive from this Syrophoenician woman. I pray that we would understand what it means not only to have faith, but to have tenacity in our faith, to pursue you, to chase after you. God, I am asking that you would do something in our midst that you would awaken afresh the Spirit of God that allows new measures of faith, new measures of trust to begin to be embodied in us. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. When we jump into this story, we see in Mark chapter 7, Jesus is having a conversation even early on from Mark chapter 7 verses 1 to about 23. He's talking to Pharisees and he's talking to scribes. He's talking to religious people. And he's in this place called Galilee, where all of the Jewish people conjugate together. And they have this question for him. And they said, why is it that you allow these people who are your people to literally take a food and eat of it when their hands are not washed? Because we Pharisees, everybody say Pharisees. See, we Pharisees, what we do is we always wash our hands before we eat. We always wash our cups before we eat. We even clean our couches before we eat. And ain't it so funny that all of these Christians are always trying to act like they clean? Like, ain't nothing dirty about them. And Jesus begins to tell them, don't you call anything defiled that I say that is clean. Because nothing that comes from the outside can defile the inside. As a matter of fact, the only thing that makes you defiled is not what comes from the outside, but it's what's on the inside of you. So you're worrying yourself, you Christian folks, about how you look and how clean you look and all of this stuff. And you know what? Jesus got tired of Christians. Jesus got tired of hanging out with Christians. It says that when we see in verse 20, 24, it says, Now, therefore, he came to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He had to leave them Christians. Got, got upset. Because Christian folks will get you tired sometimes. They so holy and they so just all prim and proper. I ain't dirty. And everybody else is. That's what Christian folks are. And Jesus said, you know what? I need a break. And so Jesus had to leave his region where the people who believed in him, who followed his teachings, he had to leave people, he had to leave Valley Gate Church. And he went to the Legion. Where's London at? American Legion. 
Is London here? She's not here. He had to go to the Legion. And it's a crying shame when Jesus has to go find rest with people who don't even believe in him. Because the people who believe in him are just wearing him out with rules. What you can do and what you can't do. I know she didn't come up in here with that on. Oh, no, he didn't. I know you don't do that. Never. But some Christians do. And so Jesus left Galilee, and he went to this place called Tyre and Sidon. And Mark in theology, whenever he talks about a place geographically, he's not just talking about a location. He's talking about really what is happening in that location. Tyre and Sidon was a place where Gentiles lived, where non-believers or those who didn't go to church lived. They believed in pagan worship. They followed other gods. They served different type of gods. They didn't serve the Jesus that we serve. Jesus had to leave his people and go to a place where people didn't love him, didn't know him, didn't follow him, just so they he could get rest and he didn't want them to know. So he's in a pagan country where people are antagonistic towards their faith. He's in a place where people don't even want to follow him. And he meets someone because all he wanted to do was to get rest and he meets someone and guess who he met? He met a woman. But if you keep understanding the text, it says that this, it says that she was a woman and she had a daughter. So that helps us understand that either she was a widow or she had a husband and now she doesn't. She had a daughter, and even more importantly, she had a daughter who had issues. Everybody say issues. Now, I know none of y'all don't have no kids who get on your nerves, and I know none of y'all don't have no little devils running around your house. But in her house, in Sidon, where people didn't follow Jesus, this girl had a demon. She didn't know Jesus. She didn't follow him. Culturally, she shouldn't speak to him, but she had a need. And her need was so big. And I talked to my wife about this yesterday, and we just started conversating, and she told me that she said, Daryl, let me tell you something. One of the toughest things it is for a mother is to have a child who has need, and I can't fix it. She said, it, it gets me uncomfortable. I can't function well. I can't sleep well, because when I see that my kids have needs, I want to satisfy that need. Here's my thrust statement. Nothing tugs more on the heart of a mother than the need of their child. Nothing tugs more on the heart of a mother than the need of their child. So when you cannot fix it, you have to faith it. Hear me. When you can't fix it, you have to faith it. See, I know that I'm second in my house, and I'm cool with that now. I used to be insecure. I I did because I married her. And then we started having these kids. I should have stopped, but I just didn't. (laughs) So then we start having these kids, and then after, you know, slowly but surely, I noticed that the attention wasn't on me no more. And then late at night, she would get up, and she would wipe when the kids would throw up, and she would sit in the bed with them and rock them and do whatever. she she do whatever it was. she started taking out her earrings, and somebody in preschool said something about her daughter. I said, oh, she tough, because she fight for her babies. And, and that's what I love about a mother is that when you know that you're a mother and you care for something, you'll do just about anything for your baby, anything. Now, I wasn't clapping because that meant she wasn't doing a lot for me. I had to get over it. I was a little insecure. And now as they get old, I'm trying to push them out and they keep coming back. This is not right. <laughs> I'm trying to get some me time and it's, they want some we time. No, you can leave time. That's what I'm trying to tell you to do. And I'm trying to figure this thing out. But even now, the other day my son came in. The boy got a haircut. Everybody say haircut. I get a haircut every week, and I've never got this response. The boy got a haircut, walked in the house. It was her birthday. She hugged him. Honey, you look so handsome. I am so happy. You, this is the best birthday present in the world. And I'm sitting there like, hold up. I got one, too. I ain't getting no love. Said that's your fault, man. You got to cut me up better wherever you at. Said it's my barber. But... I've noticed this about this, is that there's something about a mother that she shows a tenacity for what she loves. See, there's something about a mother that I don't know if I've ever seen it, and you don't even see it with animals. Man, you have a lion out there, but a gazelle with her babies. Remember I told you with Mary and Martha, 
She called her girl, roll up. They roll up and they trying to fight the lion. There's something about a mother that shows tenacity about what she loves. But what do you do when you can't fix it, mama? What do you do when you can't pull them out of whatever it is that they're in? What do you do when you've done everything that you could and they're still wayward? That's when you can't fix it and you have to faith it. And I believe that this lady here helps us understand what it means to have tenacious faith because she was a mama with a need. She had a daughter who had a big need. And she shows us four things that we need to make sure that we take. And this is not just about mothers. This is about every person in here who desires to have greater faith in God. This is about every person in here who finds themselves in a true struggle. This is about every person in here who knows that God is requiring more of them. You have to have tenacious faith. Four things we're going to get from these scriptures. Very simple. Tenacious faith is revealed when she hears about him. Everybody say, hear about him. You know, Christians. You know, Christians don't really like to do anything until they hear from him. I'm not going to do that until God tells me to. See, I love Christian vernacular. I'm not going to go over there until I hear God tell me to. I'm not going to do this because God hasn't spoken. And I love it because we really be thinking we be hearing from God. And sometimes it ain't him, just so you know. But we get into all of this Christianity. I can't do anything until I know it's God, right? But when you're desperate and you have a need, you don't need to hear from him. All you need to do is to hear about him. See, and there's different. This lady didn't grow up in church. She didn't know. She didn't know the little books in the Bible. She didn't know anything about God. She had not experienced Jesus. She had not learned from him. She didn't know that he walked on water. She was nowhere close to where he was. But when she heard about him, when she only heard about him, It says it sparks something inside of her. And this is what faith does. When you start hearing things about God, it awakens something inside of you. It begins to shake something inside of you. It begins to move something inside of you. You don't have to see it. All you got to do is hear it. You don't have to even understand it, but it begins to shake something inside of you. And God does that sometimes. He will awaken some things inside of you. And when he does, faith says, I got to pursue it. See, when you start hearing, him. I know you've been to church all your life. I know your aunt is, is an usher. I know that you sing on the worship team, but have you heard something new about him that would wake something up new inside of you? Do you know that he's even better than what you thought he was? Can he do something in you or is there a dullness in our spirit that says there's, as it relates to faith right here, I'm dead. I will keep doing the things that I do. You can knock on this door, God, all you want and I will never answer because I'm not moved by you anymore. See, when you start hearing from him and you start hearing things about him, he starts to move you. Do you know any time that God speaks, he's not just speaking to tell you how good you are. He's speaking to move something inside of you. He's not just speaking to make you feel good about yourself and to get over your little insecurities and your fears. He's speaking so that you can move mountains. You know when God speaks, every time you look in the Bible, when God speaks, he generally doesn't just speak to an individual. And even if he speaks to an individual, he's speaking to that individual about what they can do for a group of people. Now, we've deduced this thing down to God. I want to hear you tell me about me. You don't need that. Just ask your mama or ask your wife. They'll tell you. Ask your kids. They'll tell you, but God will speak to you when he knows you're ready to move. Now, he awakened something inside of her. And the reason why he awoken something inside of her is because she had a big need. And after she hears about him, the next thing that she does is when we begin to understand that tenacious faith can be revealed, It makes us go after him. Everybody say, go after him. Once again, let me mess with these little Christians a little bit. I ain't going nowhere. I'm not doing that. I don't care if it's God or not. This is just who I am. Matter of fact, I'm not going after God. Here's what our attitude says, God, you got to come after me. See, said, that's why you have to, see, that's why I don't mind you being in a situation where you have to show that you, that God shows you desperately need him. Because quite often we will not go after God if we don't think we need him. 
Uh uh-uh, uh, this is just the way that I am. I can't get out of that. I'm not going that. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm, and we say so much of what I'm not. But you know what this lady said? I'm going after him. See, she pursued him. And her pursuing him was going to cost her everything. Remember, her people didn't like Jewish people. So when she pursued him, she had to deal with her pedigree. This is the way everybody in our family does it. And now all of a sudden, you're going to try to do it differently? Are you serious? Oh, now you think you're better than us? Oh, now all of a sudden, you're following Jesus. And I remember when, girl, you was over there, out there. I don't know. I'm going after him. See, I'm going to pursue him. She had to deal with her. She had to deal with, to pursue him, she had to deal with prejudice. See, because you Gentiles don't do it the way these little Jews do. And I've noticed this in life. You got to fight to pursue God. I'm going to say that one again. You have to fight to pursue God. You want to know how I know? That's why your Bible feels like it's a ton. Because it's so hard to open. It's hard to open. You know one of the great indicators of us pursuing God? How often you read your Bible. I love what my pastor says. Read your Bible every day. Every day. I like ESPN. I go to that ESPN webpage every single day. I don't miss a day. Once I get done with y'all, I'm going to check it on the way home. (laughs) I am. Uh Uh-huh. I ain't got a lot of money, but I got a little money in the stock market. I check the market almost every day. Every day. See, there are certain things that we go after. And then you ask a little Christian, hey, have you read your Bible? No, I've been too busy. Oh, you busy? Oh, you busy? What you busy with? I've been working hard. Oh, that hard? No, no, I ain't got time. And them the ones I love, the Christians who tell you about Jesus, but you know they didn't read their Bible. You know, hold up. No, I'm too busy. I got other things going on. Really? Here's what I learned. You make time what's most important to you. You'll make time. If it's important, I bet you ain't missing your phone call or your tweet to boo. Love you. Hearts in the eyes. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I bet you get that one out. I bet you do. Uh Uh-huh. I bet you do. Joan be getting hers out to me. I'm like, I love you too, girl. My kids think we're crazy. My kids absolutely think we're crazy. But we have to go after him. And tenacious faith makes you go after him. Tenacious faith makes you leave everything that would stop you or encumber you from getting to him. It makes you go after him. Tenacious faith means that I am now exercising my faith. Instead of waiting on him, I'm going to go to him. Tenacious faith eliminates every excuse. You're a woman in a culture that doesn't value women. You're not supposed to speak to a man, but tenacious faith says, I'm going anyway. See, when the devil tells you you can't, tenacious faith says, go anyway. You got to go. And then once you get to him, you have to ask him. Everybody say, ask him. Let's read this. I love this. It says in verse 24, we're going to read 24 and 25. It says, from there, he arose, Jesus, and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. 
and he entered into the house, wanting no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter, who had an unclean spirit, she heard about him, and she came to him, and she fell at his feet. Let's go ahead and read uh, verse 26. The woman was Greek, which meant she was a Gentile. She was a non-Jew. She was not one of the chosen people. She had no spiritual pedigree. She was not in line for any type of promise or any blessing. She was a Greek Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. But she kept asking him to cast out the demon from her daughter. When you finally get to God, you got to ask him. You actually have to ask him. Ask him. And you have to ask him in such a degree to where you have to expect something of him. Many of us don't ask of him because we complain about him. God didn't show up. Woe is me. What is happening in my life? Why didn't you show up, God? And you're wasting all of these times questioning him instead of asking of him. Let me take a little bit further. The desperation in your plea may have something to do with the magnitude of your need. When was the last time you fell on your knees and you just cried out to God and said, I need you in this area? When was the last time that you just said, God, no matter what, no matter what anyone thinks, I need you? I'm going to poll a couple of people. Men, now I know that we have Siri now and I know that you have Google Maps. But before you had them, how many of you all, when you got lost, you struggled asking for directions? Okay, good. Good. You lost. Let me see your hands again. Good. Keep them up. So you lost, don't know where you're going, but you ain't asking nobody, are you? Good. Okay, good. Good. Thank you, man. Um, how many of us know that there are times that we should ask for something, but because we think the person is going to say no, we don't even ask? Okay, good. Uh -huh. That's what we call fear of rejection. Okay? Last night, we went out. And we had dinner together as a family. We were all together as a family. Um, and it's my wife's birthday. And uh, happy birthday to Joanne. That's my girl. And uh, so we went and we had dinner. And uh, we have one person in our family. It was a nice restaurant. And it was, uh, uh, it was a really nice restaurant. And they actually didn't have like little soda machines. They actually made the little drinks kind of just, they just whip them up. And I listened to this little boy and he Calls the waiter over and he said this, and I said, this, oh, he, he about to embarrass me. He about to embarrass me. He said, now this is a nice little drink. He said, are there free refills on this? And the lady looked at him. She's like, uh, no, no, it's not. And uh, so as soon as she left, I was like, boy, stop embarrassing me. Man, you see all that stuff, and it ain't, that ain't free. That's, you get free refills from the little pop machine, man. So then we're sitting there, and we notice that our food is taking a little bit too long. So the lady comes over and she apologizes. She says, listen, I'm very sorry. It's taking too long for your food. Uh, is there anything that I can do? <laughs> My little dude didn't even say nothing. He just put the cup up right here. <laughs> right? So immediately she said, yes, we'll cover that, right? So he asked and he received. My wife noticed that and she said can we have some hummus and some little uh something else and she said oh yes you can she asked and she received and the lady said is there anything else you need i got a bougie baby in my family she thinks she all that cute thinks she uh, you know can't ask nobody for nothing so she she didn't she didn't ask for nothing right the lady took three steps away and she looked she said i should have asked her for some salad When you don't ask, what do you get? <laughs> she was already gone. They came back. My boy, is, he didn't already sucked up the little drink that fast because it was free. <laughs> I thought his head was going to explode. We sitting there eating on the hummus, and the little bougie girl was like, I sure do wish I could have had that salad. 
I really do. That salad would have been really good right now. And that's what happens with us with Jesus. Jesus comes or we come to him. And we stand there in front of him knowing that he can provide for every one of our needs. But spiritually, we're too bougie to ask. Maybe it's a beneath us and maybe there's a little pride or maybe we think we're going to be rejected so we don't ask. You have not because you ask not. This woman didn't care where she came from, what people thought about her. When she came to Jesus, she fell on her knees, and not only did she ask, but she asked again. See, tenacious faith is not just that you ask, but you ask again. So we have to learn how to draw to him and come to him and seek after him and ask of him. But here's what you're going to get. And you got to hear this. This point, number four, is when you ask of him, you have to have resilient faith. Resilient. I want to read this to you, and then I want, to tell you, I want you to tell me what Jesus gave her. Because I just told you, if you're going to have tenacious faith, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have to hear of him. You're going to have to go after him, and you're going to have to ask him. Okay? But look at this. Verse 27. But Jesus said to her, listen to, listen to Jesus' answer, because I would have been mad. Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first. Basically, I'm not giving you this. This is what Jesus said. Let the children be filled first. For it is not good to take from the children's bread. There's a Bible verse that says healing is the children's bread. Talking about the children of Israel, okay? So he said, let the children, my children, the Jewish He said, let them eat. He says, but why would I take from the children's bread and throw it to a little dog? I want you to pay attention to this. You know what Jesus told her after she did all of that? She expressed all of this faith. God, I came to you. God, I heard you. I've been following you. I've been trying my best to do everything you possibly could. And you know what he said? I ain't giving you nothing, you little dog. That's what it says. He said, why would I give the children's bread to a little dog? You, you're not Jewish. You don't even come to church. You don't serve on the worship team. You don't usher. I know you've been praying about ushering for six months, but you still haven't been ushered. You don't do any of that. And you know why you need to have resilient faith? Because there are times when the enemy is going to tell you you're not up to par. Why are you asking him for that? You're not, you don't even do right. You don't even live right. Them people in church and they're serving, you, you, you're not deserving of it. And the beauty about having resilient faith is sometimes you cannot respond or you cannot retreat from the initial no. Resilient faith makes you accept the no and ask again. Listen to what she says. 28. Here's her answer to him. And she said this to him. Yes, Lord. Yeah, I'm a dog. Yes, I messed up. I didn't go to church all the time. You are absolutely right. Yes, God, I, sometimes I mess up. Yes, God, I, I mean, I, I, ain't doing, I don't wash my spiritual hands all the time. You know what? There are some things that are still wrong in my life. Yes, Lord, that is the case. But even the dogs... Under the table, they eat from the children's bread. See, when you're resilient, I'm going to be real with you. And see, this is what we have to understand. See, although we've been covered by God's grace, and he covers us, and he keeps us, let us not mistake ourselves from thinking that we still don't have a little hen of dog in us. Let, let's, let's not do that. Let's not do that. I know that we've been going to church for a long time and we sound right and we sound good and we know the songs and we do all of these things. Yes, Jesus, but we still got a little rough, rough in us over here. Uh -huh. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Sometimes it comes out at the wrong time. Yes, it, it, it does. But here's how she was resilient. When you're resilient, you're willing to take the lowly position. You don't try to act like you're something that you're not. I know you're still working on me, God, and I'm going to humble myself. 
I'm not going to sit here and act like I got it all together because I don't. When you're resilient, you understand that you're not covered by the covenant if you're not walking with God. But there's mercy. I need your mercy. See, when you have the covenant, there's a promise for you. But some of us need his uncoveted mercy. Mercy means it's his grace, and it means that he just promises and he has compassion. Some of us, we have compassion. And see, the lowly of us understand that I'm not as good as what I think I am or what people think I am. Walking in his mercy every single day of my life. When you're resilient, you know you're undeserving. And you don't try to act like you are deserving. You're undeserving. Because the wages of our sin, you know what it is? It's death. I'm undeserving of anything other than death. It means that you will gladly humble yourself and recognize that you are an outsider. Everybody say outsider. We're outsiders except for his grace. That's what we are. We're outsiders. We've done nothing to to get in. He does it for us, and that's where his grace is. And so we have to understand that we've been on the outside before just like her. We don't know her name, but we know her. Yes, we do. We're outsiders. But you know what resilient faith does? After you lower yourself into that lowly position and you ask him for mercies and you know you're undeserving and you have to walk in a humble spirit because you know you're an outsider, you know what resilient faith does? Claim it anyway. I claim it anyway. God, I believe even in all of this, I believe that your mercies are new every day. My faith in you is that you can do it when I can I trust in you and I receive what you have for me even though I know that I haven't been the best that I need to be. I need to display my faith not only when I'm perfect but even when I'm imperfect. And I'll read you this. You know why? Listen to this. Because the abundance of God's mercy that he has for even his children is so rich that even the outsiders can share in it. Even the ones who aren't perfect can share in it. The depth of our faith is revealed revealed by Christ through the resilience of our request. You want to know when you got deep faith? Because you're asking them for something. You're asking them for the thing that you need. You're saying, God, I desperately need you. I need you. I don't need you just to do something for me. I need you to do something in me. I need you. This little girl, her daughter, was demon-possessed. Money couldn't fix it. Material things couldn't cover it up. She needed faith. She needed faith. And her faith made her cry out, go after Jesus, listen to hear about him, and to be resilient when everybody else would give up. As a people, God is calling us to have this tenacious faith. He's drawn us to a new level, and he's calling us in deeper. And that's what I love. I ended with this story. I'll read this, and then I'm going to tell you this story. And you you heard this. And then he said to her in verse 29, for this saying. You know, sometimes Jesus will say no to test you. He's not saying no. He's testing your faith. He's testing the resiliency of your faith. Listen to what he says. For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out of her and her daughter was lying on the bed. As a pastor, I think people expect for us not to bleed and not to experience pain. And it's quite often, even when you try to share your pain, it's, it's, it's difficult for people to be able to receive. That's my pastor. 
And so my wife and I, when we were young and we served in ministry, would have a lot of young folks come to our house and they would see this picture uh, at our home. And I knew that the people were intrigued and they were like, man, they have a beautiful family. And we would love to, you know, we'd love to see our families grow into this or when we get married, this is what we love for our family to be. And I would always tell them, don't fall in love with the picture. Don't fall in love with the picture. See, God had to stencil and stitch and carve those smiles into our face. Because behind every little picture, there's been a place where we've had to display faith that was bigger than what we were. One of our daughters got sick and I watched my wife and all of this stuff I talk about tenacious faith, I saw it. They didn't know what it was. We knew it was some internal problems and so uh, I would see my wife cry and pray, cry and pray, cry and pray, cry and pray. And because I am the way that I am, when I realized that I couldn't help, unconsciously I began to retreat. I didn't know how to fix this. And as a man and as a father, I'm supposed to fix this. I'm supposed to make this right. And when I couldn't make it right, I found myself just retreating. And I didn't know what I was leaving her by herself. And so she would be at the hospital every night with this girl, crying and praying. We had to move our daughter to another hospital, which is about an hour and a half away, Johns Hopkins University, one of the top universities in the, uh, the Washington, D.C. area, the DMV, Baltimore, Maryland. Hour and a half away with no traffic, about two and a half when we had traffic. And every day, she would be there crying and praying, crying and praying. I would go to church and I have to stand up in front of people and I'd have to encourage them about their faith and tell them God loves you and he loves you with all of their heart. And then immediately I would leave and I would have to go to that hospital and we would just live in this hospital with her. I would get dressed on Sunday mornings, go to church, come back and with her. And then people would look at me and be like, uh, why didn't you call me, Pastor? And I was like, today ain't today. This ain't today. No, you don't. No, 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 no. And I'm going to be real with you. That's why you have to pray for your pastors because they bleed. They bleed just like you do. They face giants just like you do. I came on time and I walked in the room and I saw my wife and she's caring for a daughter and she's just there by her side, tenacious faith. And I would see her crying and praying and she began to write out these Bible verses and she would just speak life and 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 speak life. And I just stood there and God told me, Daryl, you're dressed for battle, but spiritually you're not prepared. You got to be more tenacious and you got to fight. And I would just see my wife praying and speaking over this girl. The weirdest thing, one day, she just sat up in the bed and she felt better. The next day, she felt better. And the next day, she felt better. And I'm not going to lie, for as big of a struggle that the devil took us through, I wanted sirens to go off. I wanted fireworks to go off. I wanted everybody to know that now was the time and this was the moment in which she was healed, but it didn't happen like that. Because what we fight for, and it takes a lifetime of faith to fight against, Jesus can turn it around just like that. Just like that. Just like that. Every day since that day, she's woken up, and she's still good. But what happened in us is we learned a new way to fight with tenacity, resilience. We seek after God, and we don't wait for him. As long as we hear he's around, we're going to go after it. And that's the beauty of tenacious faith. And I want to honor you, mothers. Because that's in you. Like that's really in you. And I want to honor you.
because we can learn from that. And so I say thank you. Thank you for the way that you love, your sacrifice and your commitment. Thank you for your faith. And even if you say, I'm not there yet, Pastor Darrell, I'm going to tell you it's already in you. Start exercising it. When you hear about him, go for it. If you believe him, ask for it. And even if it feels like he's saying no, humble yourself and say, I claim it anyway. I claim the victory. I claim the hope. I claim your promises. I claim health. I claim it. Because this is not just something that I want. It's something that I need. It's something that I need. And I want to pray because I believe there are some people here. There's some things you need. You conceded that you'd never get them. But God said, that's what you need. And we have to readjust our heart and readjust our faith. And we have to begin to ask God, give it to me. Fix it. Turn it around. I don't have the material ability. I don't have the financial ability. But I have the ability to believe. And I want to claim what I know you said is for me. So can you close your eyes and we pray? If there's anybody who says, God, I need you and I need you in that way. I'm not just asking, I need. I come before you today humbly. But I fall at my knees and I say, I need you to fix this. I need you to fix me. I need you, God. If there's anybody here that you need them like that, will you raise your hand so I can pray? Amen. I see those hands. You can put them down. I'm going to pray for you with your eyes closed and I'm going to speak life and encouragement over your life. Father, we thank you for every hand that represents a new measure of faith. And the Spirit of the Lord would say, you heard about me today. And that your hand declares that you're coming after me. Seek me until you find me. Ask of me. Ask of me and watch and see what I'll do. And when it gets difficult and when it gets hard, don't give up. Don't you quit. You claim it even if you don't understand it. Father, I pray that you bless each person here and that their needs will line up with what you desire for them. And if they do, if they're in your will, God, I pray that we will see you do it. There may be some other people here who don't have relationship with Jesus. You go to church, but you don't have relationship with him. You've not surrendered your life to him and said, I want to follow you with everything I have and all that I am. You say, today, I don't want to play anymore. Today, I want to choose to follow you all the days of my life. If there's anybody here who acknowledges today, I want to follow Jesus with all that I am and all that I have because I have not been. If that's you, raise your hand so I can pray for you. Amen. I see that hand. I see that hand. I want everybody to repeat after me. Dear Lord, without you, I'm lost. I need you to change me. Take me away from the things that have taken me away from you. And I promise by your grace and by your power, I will follow you with all of my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap and pray. I want to encourage you all, let's begin to ask God to raise up the meter in our own lives of faith, and let's begin to ask Him to stretch.